we'd like to welcome you to our current event and weekly Bible study for March 30th, 2008. And today's study can be entitled, C.S. Lewis, In His Own Words. C.S. Lewis, In His Own Words. Because that's what we're really going to be looking at today. Uh, this study is probably going to be very a volatile subject for a lot of people because C.S. Lewis is so highly revered in um, most Christian circles. And I just want to say right up front, this study is highly referenced with quotes from his own works. So I'm not going off half-cocked here saying things that he never said. You can go actually check out what I'm saying quote for quote for quote in his books if you so wish. Now, I am not going to stop every time that something's said and give you the actual reference. The reference will be in the PDF file that is attached to this sermon online. So you can go, and you can go look at the references, and if you don't believe them, you can look them up. We're supposed to be good Bereans. You know, as the Bible talked about, the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they sought the things out in the Scriptures, whether they be so. Well, that's what we're supposed to do. And there's a lot of people that follow this man, but we want to see what are his fruits, what is coming, what has come out of his own mouth or his own pen, I guess, for the most part, because most of what we're going to be talking about is in his own writings. Um, now, the, another Bible verse that would apply to this would be Proverbs 18.13. He that judgeth a matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. Uh, I haven't really seen anything negative about C.S. Lewis, or a whole lot negative, up on Sermon Audio, which is where this is going to be posted. Uh, so this may be a shock to a lot of people. But it really shouldn't be a shock, because these there, there's so many quotes that we're going to be looking at here today from his own writings that, you know, to be quite honest, I, I think a Christian is really without excuse. Now, Galatians uh, 4.16 says, I might therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. And that's another verse that would apply to this today. Let's just start out with some general uh, things about C.S. Lewis to establish a foundation. He lived from 1898 to, to 1963. C.S. Lewis was born in Belfast, Ireland. The younger of two sons and his he was named Clive Staple Lewis. He claimed to have been converted to Christianity in 1931 and was, as he put it, a very ordinary layman of the Church of England. Lewis was a member of the Apostate Church of England, an institution whose, institu whose history is based largely on theological compromise of Rome. A compromise. He had no theological training, which, okay, again, you know, I'm not going to emphasize that, but he didn't have any theological training. He was the author of 40 plus books, which included poems, novels, children's books, science fiction, theology, literary criticisms, educational philosophy, and an autobiography. From 1954 until his death in 1963, he was the professor of medieval and renaissance English at Cambridge University. Today, C.S. Lewis is known as a distinguished literary scholar and Christian apologist. His book, Mere Christianity, like Mere Christianity, M-E-R-E, -E, which is a book upon the beliefs of many professing Christians in today's day and age, this book is considered one of the most profound writings on Christian apologetics. Nevertheless, even this book is fraught with much theological error. Um, in 1993, Christianity Today explained why C.S. Lewis is so popular among evangelicals. Among the reasons given for his popularity was the following. Quote, Lewis's concentration on the main doctrines the church coincided with evangelicals' concern to avoid ecclesiastical separatism. So he was very, very big on having everybody come together as one big happy apostate family is what we're trying to say here. Christianity Today admits that C.S. Lewis is popular to evangelicals today because, like them, he despised biblical separation. Now, granted, the Bible says, you know, it talks about one of them that caused division among the brethren and these types of things. But this is a verse that's very much 
misused and abused in today's day and age. Because Jesus also said, I came bring to not br to bring peace, but a sword. And a man, you know, foes will be of his own household and these types of things. We are going to become biblically separate from non-believers, or we're actually supposed to. And if there's theological or doctrinal error, the Bible says a heretic, after the second and third admonition, reject in the New Testament. A heretic would be somebody that is off into some type of apostate doctrine. So the Bible itself says a heretic, after the second and third admonition, reject. Well, that sounds like biblical separatism to me. You know, the Bible says to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but to rather reprove them. Okay, and in Romans 16, verse 17 and 18, Wherefore I beseech ye, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. Well, we're supposed to mark them that cause these types of divisions. This is what we're doing today with C.S. Lewis. We're marking a person who's caused division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which we have learned in the Bible. Then it goes on to say, For they that are such, the ones that cause this division and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. That is an absolute, perfect example of what we're going to be talking about today. 1 Timothy 4.1 would also apply. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. We're going to be talking about, I mean, there's so many verses I could quote in regard to this thing today. And you may think I'm not being fair already. Well, let's look at some of what's come from C.S. Lewis, and we'll, we'll judge if I'm being fair or not. We're going to get to that in a few minutes here. As an indication of Lewis's continued popularity, annual book sales remain over 2 million Annual. The guy's been dead since 1963. But annual book sales are over 2 million, half of which comes from the Chronicles of Narnia series, an occult fantasy series written for children. Now, this also recently had a movie version that, that come out. And between C.S. Lewis and his buddy, best friend Tolkien, they've had all these different movies, you know, Lord of the Rings... Chronicles of Narnia, Witch in the Wardrobe, all these, these types of things that have come out have spawned from these two men. Now, next week we're going to be getting more into Tolkien. This information that I'm presenting to you this week is just the warm-up to what's coming next week. This is more of a foundational base regarding C.S. Lewis. Now, in an article commemorating the 100th anniversary of Lewis's birth, J.A. J.I. Packer called him our patron saint. Isn't that like a word they use in the Catholics a lot, patron saint? Okay, well, Christianity Today said Lewis, quote, has come to be the Aquinas, the Augustine, and the Aesop of contemporary evangelism. So Christianity Today is using essentially, you know, Aquinas and Augustine, top theologian Catholics, and Aesop, this pagan uh, fairy tale guy to compare them to Lewis, which is actually a pretty good comparison, pretty accurate as, as we're going to see. And again, what I'm saying to you is referenced in within the body of this particular, uh, uh, really everything that I'm going to be reading today is all referenced. So you can't accuse me of having some bent or bias when I can actually quote from his own works or what other people have actually said about him. I'm not making this up or doing some type of what they call ad hominem attack or whatever on somebody. I've been accused of that before. Um, so if we go further, in a recent issue of Christianity, Christianity Today, Millet, who is the dean of Brigham Young University, the Mormons, okay, he is quoted as saying, C.S. Lewis, quote, is so well received by the Latter-day Saint Mormons, because of his broad and inclusive vision of Christianity. That's what the Mormons want. If you go back and you reference this, this study that we did on the Mormons a month and a half, two months ago, online, um, 
And what you can do is if you ever want to know about a particular topic that I've done, you, there's a little box you can do a search for, for all the, the, the sermons or the teachings. Not just for me, but for any person up there. And you can put the word Mormonism or Mormons and it'll pop up for you. It's on my homepage on Sermon Audio. But the Mormons are very, very much about, particularly in the last 30 to 40 years, becoming much more mainstream and inclusive to include themselves, and they actually look at themselves as the true Christians. We're actually people that call themselves Christians or whatever. We're actually, you know, missing the boat. The Mormons are really the only true Christians. Okay, but in the recent years, they their language has changed to be, try to become very, very much more inclusive within Christianity. Now, this has to happen in order for us to have a one world religion under Antichrist, right? All these other religions like Jehovah Witnesses and the more, they're all going to be having a move toward this. I got this thing the other day in the mail from a Jehovah Witness lady and it was this, uh, I don't know how in the world she would have even known me. I mean, it must have been a mass mailer but it was hand addressed to me. And um, it was about this thing they were having at the, at the local kingdom hall where uh, they were going to talk about Jesus and it was, it was coinciding with Ishtar, Easter, and who is Jesus? And, and it looked like this wonderful Christian thing you were going to go to. So I wrote her back, and I actually copied and pasted this off the Chick website, because Chick has some really good resources up on his. And he's got a whole book called How to Answer Your Jehovah Witness Friends or whatever. And um, I think the guy that writes his name's Heinz. But anyway, the whole book's online. You can go up on Chick and reference it. And I copied and pasted the section about what do Mormons believe about Jesus Christ. And then I personalized the front, I put it in a Word document, personalized the, the very top of it, and sent it off to her. You know, So it looked like I wrote, I don't want to be deceitful, but I'm saying this is information that is valid, and that she needs to know about. And I pray to God she gets saved. Uh, I'm not trying to do it to be Mr. One-Upsman, but you know, she's out there, bold enough to put out these mailers, talking about how people are, you know, and they're, all it is is one big lie. They're trying to get you into that cult, and they're using the bait as Jesus Christ. And then they're going to get you in there. And then they're going to bestow upon you all their false doctrines. And get you all caught up into bondage. And here, the next thing you know, you're a cult member. I take great offense to that. I take great offense to any religion that would use the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as a excuse to do their evil works. And to manipulate and to deceive people. And I, I think... I really believe God would feel the same way. Because it's one thing for a Buddhist to say, okay, you got to go to whatever, Krishna or, or uh, you know, Buddha or Hindu to go to Shiva or whatever. But it's another thing for a cult to use the name of Jesus Christ in order to deceive people. I believe that's more grievous in God's eye. At least that's the way it seems to me. Okay? I, I just, it really, really sets me off when religions do that. And uh, Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses are two of the worst when it comes to that. And yet at the same time, what they'll do is they'll bait you in with Jesus and then they'll give you their interpretation of Jesus. Uh, the Mormons believe that... Um, what is it? The Mormons believe that Jesus is brothers with Satan... And the Jehovah Witnesses believe that Jesus is actually the My Michael the Archangel. That's one of the first places they'll take you to. Uh, it's some verse in Daniel when they'll try to manipulate you into thinking that Jesus isn't who he says he was. He's actually just the Archangel Michael. So if you believe that, then you start then you start to question every single other thing in the Bible. Not only that, they use what they call a New World Translation, which is just another false watered-down version. So that makes it easier for you to get manipulated. So, going back to this article, by the time of his death, Lewis had moved from idealism, which is the idea of no idea of a personal God, to pantheism, which is an impersonal God in everything, and then to theism, which is just the existence of God. In Letters to Malcolm, which is one of his writings, on page 107, Lewis indicates that shortly before his death, he was turning toward the Catholic Church. Lewis termed himself, quote, very Catholic. Why would he say this? Well, his prayers for the dead, his belief in purgatory, his rejection of a literal resurrection of the body are serious deviations from biblical Christianity. And we're going to go way further on this and how he was 
tied up with Catholicism. Um, and this is that was actually from his biography, C.S. Lewis biography, page 234. He even went to a priest for regular confessions. Did you know that? And he received the sacrament of extreme unction on 7 63 Now, I was thinking about giving that sacrament to Doug today, but I, I, I don't know. I, I just wasn't in the mood, but anyway, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so he got this sacrament of extreme unction. His contention that some pagans may belong to Christ without knowing it is a very destructive heresy as well. He said that in Mere Christianity. I really, don't you love that title, Mere Christianity? I mean, why, you know, what's not to like about the title? That was on page 176, 177. As his statement was that, quote, Christ fulfills both paganism and Judaism. Did you hear that? Christ, Jesus Christ fulfills both paganism and Judaism? Yes, there's a lot of things in the Old Testament where Jesus Christ is clearly indicated, but the Bible says that the Jews have been blinded in part until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. They don't see it right now. And yes, he does fulfill the Bible, but that Christ fulfills paganism? Whoa, I mean, that's pretty dangerous. He said that on, on Reflections in Psalms, page 129. Lewis believed that we are to become gods. Did you know that? I'm talking on this earth. Not later, on this earth. An apparent affirmation of his the theistic evolution. He also believed that the book of Job is, is unhistorical. He says that on Reflections on Psalms, page 110. I'm going to give you some of these now, but I'm not going to give them all to you later, because there's just too many. Uh, that the Bible contained errors. He said that in the same book on page 110 and 112. And the Bible is not divinely inspired. He said that in the Inklings, page 175. Lewis used profanities, told body stories, and frequently got drunk with his students. That was from um, a citing from World Magazine, 519.90. Now that's well, you know, if you look at you know what he did, that's well known. Christians need to read more critically the abolition of man, the problem of pains, miracles, the great divorce, and God in the dock. These are some of his writings. Now, I, I'm not going to tell you you need to read more, more critically. You shouldn't be reading this junk at all. Stick to the word of God. This is why you very rarely ever hear me recommend a lot of different authors to go read. Because the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and that maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Jeremiah 17.5 Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. Do you know how many people trust in this man? It's, it's, he has a cult following. He not only has a cult following within Christianity, he has a cult following within the occult world. There's all kind of people that are involved in witchcraft and the occult that absolutely say you read C.S. Lewis and you read Tolkien before you go further into this occult thing, whatever you're trying to do. That's well documented as well. We're going to be looking at that more next week. I mean, that's a great that's a great uh, endorsement, isn't it? People that are heavily involved in the occult, yeah. you got to read C.S. Lewis and Tolkien to understand it, man. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. The devil's very good at what he does. C.S. Lewis is a great example of that the devil is very good and very subtle at what he does. The guy that led me to the Lord, um, he gave me a book called En Route to Global Occupation by Gary Ka. Great book. Um, and uh, he was from a, he worked in the UN, and um, it was kind of his testimony about working in there, getting saved, coming out, and his whole experience. <coughs> Well, he also, and he would give those books out, and I think it was a tremendous witnessing tool. But another thing that he was really into was C.S. Lewis. And I remember he was reading, like, he was trying to get me to read, the, it's called the Screwtape Files, Screwtape Letters or whatever, N another great title. And I don't know if I tried reading it or what, but I just couldn't get into it. I just, I couldn't. There was nothing about him that appealed to me, even as a baby Christian. Now, I'm not saying if you've read him that I'm better than... I just never could get into the guy. Um, and then later to find out what he said and what he was into, I'm so glad I didn't. But this, these materials, 
by C.S. Lewis are many, many times given to baby Christians as Christian primer tools on, on the faith. This is the last thing you should be giving to a baby Christian. As a mature Christian, the only reason I would ever say to look at any of this is to expose the man. You've got to be really careful what you're, what you're, especially as a baby Christian. If you corrupt your foundation as a baby Christian, the Bible says if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Psalm 11 verse 3. You don't want your foundation corrupted from the get-go. But unfortunately, that's a big problem with Christianity today, or what is called Christianity. Because, you know, they supposedly get saved, and, and maybe it's e easy believism. They say some little prayer, and they think that, that they're all good. And then their lukewarm pastor, or whoever, who's a hireling most of the time, and not and not does has no true love for the sheep, but he's doing it for the money, because he's a hireling. He's in some 501c3 corporation, which he calls a church. I could go on and on about all that. They get him to read this stuff. Instead of going to the King James Bible and putting that into their system, they're putting spiritual junk food into their body by reading all these commentaries and things like that. Now, I'm not saying all commentaries are bad, but I'm saying you really need to rely on the Word of God. I always go back to the Word of God. Period. That, and that's why I don't label myself under any, any denominational state. I'm just, I call myself a Bible-believing Christian. That's it. Born again, Bible-believing Christian. Go to the Word of God. That is how you build your faith. Okay? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is how we get saved. For you're saved by grace, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we want to really be careful what we're putting in uh, what we're reading in, in these types of things, especially if it has a a spiritual uh, bent to it, like all of C.S. Lewis' writings do. It's very, very dangerous, this stuff. Now, for example, Lewis never believed in a literal hell, but instead he believed hell was a state of mind one chooses to possess and become. Every shutting up of the creature within the dungeon of his own mind is, in the end, hell. That's from The Great Divorce, page 65. These are different books that he wrote. So again, he didn't believe in a literal hell. He believed in purgatory. He, we're going to see he believed in prayers to the dead. He went to auricular confession. Uh, he believed in all the, the, the sacraments that the Catholics and the Anglicans and these types of things. We're going to look at all this stuff. It's unbelievable what this guy was involved with. And yet today he's revered. If it is true to say that you are what you eat, then it is also true to say that a Christian is what he hears and reads. Well, that's, that's true. As a man thinketh, so is he. That's what the Bible says. As a man thinketh, so is he. Okay? The Bible also says there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So, we've got to really be careful what we're, what we're uh, embracing here. Thus, if Christians are brought up on a diet of C.S. Lewis, it should be no surprise to us to find that they are seeking to continue the legacy of C.S. Lewis. And this is what I really see a lot in you know, the modern day Christian movements. The Apostle Paul said, A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Leaven is always a type of sin. Well, his writings had so much leaven in them, how could it not affect you spiritually if you read it? And yet the man is so revered. There was a guy recently up on Sermons Audio, and I noticed that he had this, this, this teaching on C.S. Lewis. And I had never seen him. He was in the top 50, and he was there like every day. So I clicked into it, and I started listening to it, and it was about, I don't know, kind of just going on about... Uh, C.S. Lewis, and he was in a car thinking about something, and he had took this trip, and it was fluff. It got nothing into what we're going to be getting into today, which is straight from his own writings. It was glorifying the man. And I went, I, one thing I thought was interesting is I went up to his site, and he had several hundred teachings up on the internet. Most of them didn't even have 50 downloads for the teachings, because you can see if they had, what kind of downloads they had. But this one thing on C.S. Lewis, I think it had three to 4,000, maybe more downloads. And I thought to myself, 
Is this an indication of the priority levels of Christians where they will flock to hear anything about this apostate C.S. Lewis and, and all this other guy's teachings had no hardly any downloads at all. But this one, he had three to 4,000. That was one of the reasons I ended up doing this because I realized how, how seriously many Christians take the subject with C.S. Lewis. So if we go further... Thus, if the evangelicals read and applaud such books as mere Christianity, it should come as no surprise if we find them working towards a common mission with the enemies of the gospel. It's a very good point. If we are into these books that people that are actually into witchcraft also applaud, aren't we on some level working toward a common denominator with the pagan religions, with other people that have nothing to do with Christianity? Sure we are. This is these books and, and his writings and these movies are going to be are are and are going to be and have been a major tool of Satan to bring us toward not only a one world religion, but the embracing of witchcraft. Witchcraft is going to be the religion, the essence of the one world religion that we're moving into. The Bible says in Daniel that when the Antichrist arises, he will cause craft to prosper in his hand. He will be a speaker of dark sentences. This is going to be the essence of the one world religion, witchcraft. I mean, hey, if you were the Antichrist, wouldn't that logically be where you would try to get us to? I mean, would it just be like pseudo-Christianity? Would you be content with that if you were the Antichrist? Or would you, at some level manipulate and manipulate until you got us to the point where we were flat out, but basically the whole world is practicing witchcraft. And it's going to be done under the guise, most likely, of the New Age type of witchcraft, which is going to come like white witchcraft. It's good witchcraft. And much of C.S. Lewis' writings are presented that way. You have the white witchcraft and you have the bad. The black. And it's the white against the black. And the white's good and the black's bad. It's good against evil. See, this is the deception that, that this thread that runs through his writings is so prevalent. The young Christian should be careful what he reads. In these positions, those in positions of authority, pastors, teachers, parents, should be careful what they recommend others to read. And I, I totally agree. Uh, we're responsible for that. To whom much is given, much is required. I mean, if, if the Bible says that, it, uh, Jesus said, if you offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better than a mill. I mean, what if, you, what if you have a whole bunch of kids and you're having leading some Bible study? For, for example, and you have these kids, and they're Christians or whatever in your church, and you say, hey, kiddies, what I'm going to do is I'm going to loan out these books on C.S. Lewis, and these are really, really good for you to read, and you'll like them, because they're, they're, they're like kind of like Harry Potter, but it doesn't have all the overt witchcraft, even though this was the, essentially the beginnings of Harry Potter, this type of writings, and they go back and they read this, and it's this fantasy slash almost occult thing you're reading, and they get enamored with this, and they get all these unbiblical notions in their head, and the Bible becomes boring, the Word of God doesn't take preeminence anymore, and they get off into all this stuff. What have you done? You've caused them to fall away from the faith. You've, you've led them down the road to hell, or you're leading them. You're pointing them in that direction. You're not pointing them to the Word of God at all. So, you're going to be responsible for that. Jesus said that it would be better for they that offend these little ones that believe in me that if a millstone were hung about his neck and he were cast into the midst of the sea. This is a very serious issue. It is difficult to attempt to evaluate the theology of a man regarded by many as the greatest contemporary lay writer for the Christian faith. With his witty English humor, sharp and sim simple logic, and seeming loyalty to the tenets of the Christian faith, C.S. Lewis won the admiration of thousands in England and here in the United States. Nevertheless, the following is such an attempt. In other words, we're going to try to evaluate his theology. We've already got into it a little bit. How, even after what we've just went over, the seeming loyalty that he has, and this following that he has, in light of what we just read, how can he, I don't understand how he could have this. I, I just, I've never understood it, even as a baby Christian, because I found out about this, um, 
kind of as a baby Christian, a lot of this stuff. It wasn't hard to find. What did C.S. Lewis believe on creation? C.S. Lewis believed that evolution was true to an extent in the past, but that it will be superseded in the future. Now again, every single thing I'm talking about here is referenced in different books, okay? He also believed, for we have good reason to believe that animals existed long before men. For long centuries God perfected the animal form, which was to become the vehicle of humanity and the image of himself. You understand why they said he believed in theistic evolution? He believed that animals were here before us, and that it sounds to me like they were the ve- it says he, they were the vehicle of humanity. Well, that sounds like we have man evolved into, uh, from an animal to a human. And then he says, eventually God caused a new kind of consciousness to descend upon this organism. You'll see he refers to mankind as a species as well. Well, that's what the that's what the New Agers do. That's what that's what the glo- people that want to depopulate the planet. I, I read you that um, that quote from um, Maurice Strong in my Avion Flu presentation, where he said that, that mankind, this species, is out of control as far as the breeding goes. And the species must be stabilized and rapidly. Whenever you hear mankind referred to as a species, typically that's something that you'll hear the millionaires and billionaires like Maurice Strong and Ted Turner do in order to justify depopulation. Well, they, he has this very much same kind of, of, of writings with what he says. So God calls a new kind of consciousness to descend upon this organism. So in other words, we evolved essentially from some kind of animal, and then God caused a new consciousness to, to, to descend on this organism known as man. He said that on Problem of Pain, page 133 and 77. I'll give that reference. Man, he also said, man is the highest of the animals. That's a quote. Another quote. But he, man, still remains a primate and an animal. End of quote. That was from uh, Reflections on Psalms, page 115 and 129. Then he also said, if you mean simply that man is physically descended from animals, I have no objection. End of quote. He held that the Genesis account came from pagan and mythical sources. Pagan! Oh, now we're getting into the absolute, totally question of the word of God. Well, again, how could you say the stuff that he's saying and not question the word of God? The word of God took no preeminence in this man's life. That's obvious from already for what we've looked at. I'm only on the second page. I wanted to do a very, very thorough study on this man because, again, he's held in such high regard. This is from his own writings. Easily to verify. So, if you want to persist in following this man after you've heard this, now you're in a much more precarious position. Because, again, the Bible says to whom much is given, much is required. Then it says, he held again, the Genesis account came from pagan and mythical sources. He says, I have no therefore, I have therefore no difficulty accepting, say, the view of those scholars who tell us that the account of the creation in Genesis is derived from earlier Semitic stories which were pagan and mythical. That's what he believed about the book of Genesis. Sounds like a real staunch defender of the faith. You know, like the Bible talks about in Jude, earnestly contending for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Oh, he's earnestly contending for it. He's earnestly trying to destroy it, is what he's doing. Now Genesis 2.20 says, And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was found there was not found a help meet for him. No help meet for Adam's needs could be found for, for him from among the animals. That's a great point, isn't it? No, Adam was created separately and distinctively. They said, the Lord said, come let us make man in our image, in our image. Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Some people will say it's Father God, Mother Goddess, and Jesus, like the pagan trinity. That's, that's a very common belief system. 
Um, actually, they actually do believe that in Mormonism at the deepest levels. But that's a, that's a whole other study. Anyway, so Adam gave name to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found in help me for him. No help me for Adam's knees could be found for him be, among the animals because he was not an animal. Okay? He wasn't a donkey and God waved a magic wand and turned him into a human being. Like, kind of like C.S. Lewis is expecting us to believe this. Adam needed someone created in the image of God like he was himself in order to be a help for him. God knew this also. Genesis 127, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. C.S. Lewis casts many of the animals as being like God in some way since this is necessary to arrive at what the Bible says without actually be taken literally. Well, that's how he portrays these animals in like the Chronicle of Narnia and a lot of these other cult fiction fantasy things. These animals take on the personages of God. Like the lion, I believe, in the Chronicle of Narnia who was like the Christ. We're going to talk about that more later. Thus man... Thus man is the closest to God, but he's still an animal. So if we go further, what did he believe on um, salvation? This is a quote from one of his books. Let's see which one it is. Mere Christianity. This is a quote from Mere Christianity, page 176-177. There are people in other religions who are being led by God's secret influence to consecrate, no, to concentrate on those parts of their religion which are in agreement with Christianity and who thus belong to Christ without knowing it. Did you know that, Doug? Billy Graham told it to him. Yeah, and, and so did Robert Schuller, because that's exactly what they believe too. Oh, no, not Billy Graham or Robert Schuller. Stalwart Defender of the Faith? Robert Schuller? Oh, yeah. I saw him. They said it on TV. The interview, you can go up on Google and watch. Well, I'll, I'll send you, if you don't believe me, I'll send you the, the thing on... Well, look, just do a, a search for Billy Graham on my sermons. Okay? And go to the PDF file, and you, and, and, um, you can read the whole transcript of the interview. If you don't believe that, then you can go keyword search it on Google or YouTube and watch it. That's a very common thing. Well, I wonder where Billy Graham and Schuller heard about it for the first time. Maybe they heard about it through C.S. Lewis. There are people in other religions who are being led by God's secret influence to concentrate on those parts of their religion which are in agreement with Christianity? And who thus belong to Christ without knowing it? What a bunch of lies this is. They belong to Christ without knowing it. Wow, that, that's, that's a pretty amazing thing. I, I've never... Uh, how unscriptural can you possibly get? Many, and here he goes on to say this, many of the good pagans, long before Christ's birth, may have been in this position good pagans. As though there's... You're either saved or you're not saved. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt, thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10. For you are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But there is only one way. There is only one way. Some Buddhists cannot get grandfathered in and not even know about it. That's an impossibility. Jesus Christ said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That is it. So, again, more absolute, total, apostate, heretical lies. What did he believe on heaven? He said, this is from one of his books, another one of his books, all scriptural imagery, harps, crowns, gold, etc., is of course merely symbolical, an attempt to express the inexpressible. Number one, how could he know this? So what is like heaven? Like this blank piece of paper and we just kind of go there and do nothing? 
And this is revolting to say the least. Jesus is very clear in this. John 14, 2 said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Well, evidently, according to Lewis, that's all symbolical. Like, I would go to this reprobate to get advice. But you know what? Most Christians do. Most Christians go to this man. Unbelievable. I'm three pages into this, and I mean, I think I've heard enough to... <laughs> but, let's really look at this in totality. Jesus would have told us if all the descriptions of heaven were not real, we have to take it by faith or call him a liar. A man cannot call Jesus Christ a liar and be saved. Which is essentially what C.S. Lewis does in his writings. When he contradicts the word of God. You're basically making the word of God of none effect by your traditions. Lewis's problem with the descriptions of heaven being literal is that he judged the Bible by his own half bushel. As we will see, the Chronicles of Narnia is absolutely loaded with symbolism. So he read the Bible in light of himself. That is, he made God in his own image. Isn't that what most people do? Well, I don't believe God would send me to hell. He's a God of love. Okay, what have you just done there? You've created your own religion. What did C.S. Lewis do with all of his writings, essentially? Because so much of what he said was non-biblical. He created his own religion. That's why he has his own cult following to this day. Two million books per year sold by this reprobate? And he's been dead since 63? The devil's very good at what he does. Now we've got the movies, now we've got the kids being influenced by this stuff. Now, granted, the Bible said it was going to be this way. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, that there was going to be a great falling away, and that God was going to be the one that sends the strong delusion, that they will believe a lie, that they might all be damned to receive not the love of the truth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, God's going to be the one that does this. So this is fulfillment of Scripture. It's sad. It's a sad indictment on the Christian church, pseudo-Christian church, but it is fulfillment of Scripture. And, as the Bible says, And yet my people love to have it so. They took pleasure in unrighteousness. They did not want the truth. In the book, The Great Divorce, he says, There's no literal hell. It is a state of mind. Every shutting up of the creature within the dungeon of its own mind, in the end, is hell. Uh, now, Luke says in 1623, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. This was the rich man. The Bible is very clear on what hell is like. No one takes the word of God literally. No one who takes the word of God literally need has any questions to what it is. Three times Jesus described it as thus, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Mark 9.44. C.S. Lewis did not want to believe in this because he knew he was going there. Oh, now you've really crossed the line. Whatever. Again, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? How could this man have went to heaven? How could the Holy Spirit of God dwelt in this man and never in his whole life convicted him of the rank apostate heresy that he was involved in? How, how could that be so? Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, faith, temperance. Where did where, This man wasn't putting forth truth. He was putting forth a little bit of truth mingled with lies. Which is, what the, which, which is what the devil is most adept at doing. Rat poison is 95% or 97% good food for a rat. And 2-3% to poison. All it takes is a little bit of leaven to kill you. He also said, in, um, in this book, uh, which book is this? The Problem of Pain... On page 71, I have the deepest respect for pagan myths. Still from... This is unbelievable. This is a quote. 
all these are quotes. I have the deepest respect for pagan myths. Still more for myths in the Holy Scriptures. End of quote. <laughs> what more would you need to hear? We're 45 minutes into this teaching right now. But there's so much more. That is unbelievable. Lewis believed that all myths point toward God, and therefore pagan myths could be respected. He believed that some of the myths in the Bible were true, such as Jesus' life, while others were not, such as creation. Revelation 22.19 says, And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in the book. By taking away from God's words like this, he openly showed himself to be an unbeliever. Absolutely. Not only did he take away from the words of God, but he added to. Mostly what he did is add to, if you think about it. He added to them his leaven. Now the Bible says then, in, in um, Revelation 22, it says if you add to this book, then he'll add unto you the plagues. So, he, he did both. C.S. Lewis. John 14, 24 says, He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. Well, let's turn it around. Here's an, here's an earmark of a Christian. He that loveth me, keepeth my sayings. Well, that, well, that does, you know what that also implies? That does imply, if, if you keep his sayings, it implies that you're going to know his sayings. It implies you're going to have some... Uh, level of, of memorization of some of the Bible at some form or level. Okay? He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. Does it sound like to you that C.S. Lewis was keeping the sayings of God? I don't see it. And the word which he hears not mine, but the Father which sent me. Okay? That was the end of that verse. No man that loves Jesus Christ could talk this way about his revelation. And, and as you can see, C.S. Lewis was pretty irreverent. This is another uh, article entitled, C.S. Lewis, The Devil's Wisest Fool. Clive Staples Lewis has been perhaps the single most useful tool of Satan since his appearance in the Christian community sometime around World War II. That's a pretty bold statement. The single most useful tool of Satan? Since his appearance, and I, you know, I tell you what, as much influence as the guy have, it would be hard to argue with. With his strong belief in non-denominational Christianity, which he termed mere Christianity, well, again, with the non-denominational thing, they were first called Christians in Antioch, okay? I think most denominations are so leavened anymore, anymore anyway, but that's a whole other study which he termed mere Christianity, and his apparent orthodoxy and doctrine, the influence of his pen has reached across many years. When the light of God's holy Bible is focused upon his writings, however, his heresy and outright love of Satan comes into bold view. Though a highly acclaimed and widely published Christian author, when judged by his own words, with the word of God, it becomes clear that he indeed that he was indeed a fool in the most extreme sense of the word, yet a very subtle one that was that was and is extremely useful to his father, the devil. Why? Why would you say he's the father? Well, the Bible says the devil is the father of lies, right? And Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil, and of his works you will do. Well, that's what he's doing. He's, he's just following his father, the devil. Matthew 12, 37 says, For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. That verse should make us all very nervous. It, it does me. Wherefore, uh, then Matthew 7.20, Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Well, let's, you know, we're looking at his fruits. We're looking at his words today. Luke 6.45 says, A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. Can we say that about what we've just read about C.S. Lewis? And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, which is, just, which is deceitful above all things, according to Jeremiah 17.9, he bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart that his mouth speaketh. Well, I'll tell you what. His heart was corrupt. Bad. Real bad. 
according to what his own writings indicate, John 7.24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. We're supposed to judge these things as Christians. Some will say, oh, you're judging him. Yeah, you're right, I am judging him. The Bible says, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Jesus said, judge righteous judgment. You don't judge hypocritically, which is where you have a beam in your own eye and you're looking at the speck in your brother's. We're not looking at a speck in C.S. Lewis's eyes today. We're looking at a beam in both eyes. The man was a tool of the devil. You're supposed to judge that. Lewis speaks blasphemy. This is C.S. Lewis beyond personality. Uh... He said, God said in the Bible that we were gods. And that he is going to make good his words. If we let him, for we can prevent him, if we choose, he will make the feeblest and the filthiest of us a god or a goddess. This is a quote from him. He'll make, in this life now, remember, we're going to be a god or goddess in this life. So Nonetta and Lisa, you, you might want to get on your goddess clothes. Because I think you got it coming, you know, I mean... Anyway, uh, well, Taylor, yeah, too, sorry. I don't want to leave anybody out. Um, he will make the feeblest and filthiest of us into a god or a goddess, a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine. End of quote. Wow, I mean, that was spoken like, you know, that really reminds me of a lot of the New Age drivel I read. C.S. Lewis was baptized as an Anglican in St. Mark's Dandela, Belfast, and became an atheist in his teens. His education in Oxford was interrupted by World War I, but after recovering from a wound, he, he returned there to continue his studies. The New International Dictionary of the Christian Church states on page 594 that Lewis moved slowly through atheism, through yetism, romanticism, to absolute idealism, and finally theism. Returning to worship in the Church of England in 1929. Sounds like he had a really good foundation. You know. He was allegedly a bachelor for most of his life. Though there are more or less substantiated stories of his sexual relationship with Janie Moore, who lived with him for years. Oh, that's, that's good. Talk about fleeing appearance of evil. He was in this illicit relationship, you know, with a lady named Janie Moore. However, he married Joy... Joy Davidman Gresham at age 58. She was supposedly converted partly due to his books. Oh boy, that would be a real good conversion, wouldn't it? Could you imagine what you could do with a whole room of converts? Well, C.S. Lewis? Not a whole lot of anything. You could do a lot for Satan. What could you do for Christ, though? With a foundation like that. After meeting him in England, and this is this Joy David Mingresham, after meeting him in England, she returned to the United States where she was divorced from her husband. According to two of his friends, Gresham's husband divorced her on the grounds of desertion. She deserted him for C.S. Lewis. She returned to England and made herself available to Lewis, who married her shortly thereafter. So even his marriage was in disobedience to the word of God. Unbelievable. The following is an excerpt from Conversation with Thomas Howard, a Roman Catholic considered as one of the foremost experts on the life and the work of C.S. Lewis. Okay, this is a... And again, that's what I love about this study, because it's so highly referenced. Question. Now, this is a question to... Um, question by the person interviewing this Thomas Howard, who was a Roman Catholic who is one of the foremost experts on the life of C.S. Lewis. This is from 1998. Um, I have not read the whole book. It's, it's called Jack, C.S. Lewis and His Times by George Sayer, which is a biography of C.S. Lewis. But someone drew my attention to a certain section describing a holiday where George Sawyer, C.S. Lewis, and C.S. Lewis's wife, Joy, the one he was married to, um, unbiblically, went off to Greece. C.S. Lewis attended some Greek liturgies and a Greek wedding. 
I was surprised that Sora quotes C.S. Lewis as telling him that all of the litur- that of all the liturgies he had ever attended. Okay, just to describe a liturgy in these types of churches, like the Greek Orthodox, and, and this is true with Catholics, right? Too, um, it's basically like the service itself that's set in stone with particular scriptural readings almost wrote prayers that they're praying. It's all rehearsed, essentially. And, you know, the Bible says not to pray vain repetitions and things of this nature. It's part of part and parcel of a lot of what they do, really, in paganism as well. Okay? And when C.S. Lewis went to Greece, he went to some Greek liturgies and a Greek wedding... And then it goes on to say, I was quite surprised that Sayer quotes C.S. Lewis as telling him that of all the liturgies he'd ever attended, evidently this was something that C.S. Lewis loved doing, going to these false church liturgies, C.S. Lewis preferred the Greek Orthodox liturgy to anything he he had seen in the West, Protestant, or at the Roman Catholics. Then he went on to say that of all the priests and monks that he had ever had the opportunity to meet, the Orthodox priests that he ran across in his sojourn to Greece, were the holiest, most spiritual men he had ever met. C.S. Lewis referred to a certain look they had, a sense. Well, you know what? I got a Bible verse for that. And it says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Oh, you know, hey, the devil can do whatever he can to to try to impress you or make you think that somebody's religious or holy. There's nothing holy about these. These men in these false apostate religions, Satan's goal through them is to try to get as many people to hell as possible. To burn in hell, ultimately in the lake of fire forever. That's the goal. Okay? So... If Satan can make somebody appear real holy and nice and all this other stuff and get you to hell, he don't care. Mission accomplished. I I guess that's why, again, I so despise these types of false religions that do this under the name of God or Jesus or whatever. I know that, and then he goes on to say, I know you are a scholar and an expert on C.S. Lewis, so I'd like your comments. So, What I just read was a question posed to this Howard guy, this Thomas Howard, who is this Roman Catholic considered as one of the foremost experts on C.S. Lewis. Here's his response, this Howard. He says, you've put your finger on a very interesting point. A very, very interesting point. He said, I had an article in a Roman Catholic magazine called Crisis several months back on this very point. Now, he writes for Roman Catholic magazines, okay? C.S. Lewis was not a sacramentalist, or, or was a sacramentalist, meaning he was really big into the sacraments, okay? You know, the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church, basically um, ways, the things that you have to do, works that you have to do within the church, or uh, even without the church, in order to get saved, okay? In order, their way to get saved. It's all about works, in other words. C.S. Lewis was a sacramentalist and an Anglican who really did not want to pursue the ecclesiastical question further than he did. Lewis himself and I, Lewis himself and I probably can find you the quote in one of his letters. I think it's in the letters to Malcolm. Lewis speaks of having been at an Orthodox liturgy and he said he loved it. He said some stood, some sat, some knelt, and one old man crawled around on the floor like a caterpillar. He absolutely loved it. End of quote. Sounds like a lot of your charismatic services. I sent out a thing the other day on this on this uh, lady in the uh, Pentecostal church. And uh, this lady pastor, who looks like she had a crew cut, um, probably could be a drill sergeant, maybe. And uh, she probably thinks she is a drill sergeant in the army of God. Anyway, sorry. Um, but she's in there, and she has this lady, this prophetess in there. And the lady is prophesying. Prophesying. And the whole time she's prophesying, her head is, is whipping back and forth. Like, like just whipping. Like a bobblehead. The whole time. This goes on for several minutes. And it's just an example of of all the unbiblical things that go on in in churches, particularly charismatic circles. The Bible says that that everything should be done in decency and in order. Okay? And in 
for women not to take this type of preeminent position in a church where they're in there. I mean, I'm sorry, but she was she was basically acting like an idiot, you know, demon possessed, really. And yet she is the one they're all looking to, to get their spiritual guidance from. Even though most of what's coming out of their mouths is totally against the Bible, it doesn't matter because they believe it's this new revelation from God. What a joke. Uh, a sick joke. So if we go back to this article, Lewis's good, very close friend, J.R.R. R. Tolkien, the man who wrote the Hobbit books and was a very devout Roman Catholic, you know, that's funny. When I was young, this is way before I was I wasn't saved. I had a girlfriend in high school, and her dad really liked me, and he gave me the Hobbit books, the Lord of the Rings. He says you got to read these. Now he was a devout Catholic. I don't know. Maybe that was his subtle way of trying to maybe witness to me, in a way, because that was the only thing the man ever really really emphasized that I need to read. And this is how people in, in other religions will try to lure you in to certain things. But yeah, J.R. Tolkien, he wrote the Hobbit books, Lord of the Rings, was a very devout Roman Catholic, tried hard over the years to budge Lewis across the line. He got nowhere. Oh yeah, because Lewis was so, just such a you know, stalwart defender of the faith. Lewis would not speak about church questions. You know, I'm sorry, but like when we go out to eat and stuff, like after we do this, that's all we talk about is the Lord and, and, and the Bible and stuff. I mean, I'm not going to say it's all we talk about, but it does tend to dominate our conversations. Not because we're trying to act religious, just because it's within us. We want to do that. But a guy like this, and so much of the time, pastors... You get them off on their own. They don't want nothing to do. They don't want. They don't want to talk about the Bible. They don't want to talk about Christianity. Why? If the Holy Spirit lives inside you, shouldn't that be something you want? Especially if you've, let's say, for the week, been kind of isolated, because it's kind of hard to find Christians anymore to really fellowship. Most of the people I've ever been around don't want to talk about the Lord. Okay, we heard enough about that in church. <coughs> Bless God, we don't need to be talking about it all the time. We need to go to all-you-can-eat buffets afterward. Oh, they, that's real big in the Baptist circles. I've been there, too. Not to say I'm against the Baptist tenets, okay? I'm saying a lot of what they do, just like a lot of denominations, is unbiblical. Yeah, bless God. We can't, we can't drink, and we can't smoke, but we can go out, we can eat a ton of food. We can be gluttonous. <laughs> I'm serious. That's pretty much how they look at it. But, um... Yeah, they don't want to talk about God. They don't want to talk about the Lord. They don't want to talk about the Bible. I'm sorry, when I'm with Christians, that is an inevitability for me. It just flat out is. Not to say I think I'm so much better. I'm just saying that, that if you're truly fellowshipping with somebody that's a Christian, that's just going to happen. But, and I guess it didn't for C.S. Lewis... He would not speak about church questions. He wouldn't do it. We only know for sure what C.S. Lewis loved. We only knew for sure that C.S. Lewis loved the Orthodox Church. Why? Because it made him feel religious. He was no different than any other pagan. Because essentially that's what they are. They're pagans. They can do it under the name of, of Jesus all they want. It doesn't make it so. It does not make it so. Doug brought up a really good point. He's had more exposure to some of these things than I've ever had. And um, that's what's really cool about this little group that we have, because we've each got our own little niche and exposures thing where we can kind of help others and um, add to um, maybe an a overall experience about a certain thing. And with the liturgies, when you, when you come away from them, and these, these, particularly if you think about it, if you're going to someone in ornate church, like some big multi-million dollar Catholic or Greek or whatever church you're going to, and you come away and, and these liturgies are these very, very well written, well scripted, you know, they're all dressed up and, and, you're re and you come away thinking, you know, that you're on this higher spiritual plane almost. And what is that if you look at it at its essence? It's arrogance, it's pride. 
is what it's actually instilling in the person. This is why it's so hard, one of the reasons it's so hard for them to break away, because they've, if, especially if you've been brought up in this, you think, well, I'm, I'm better, this is good, this is religious. And you come away with this sense of pride, and pride blinds you. Pride, if you let it exist in your, in your body, your soul and spirit, it will blind you to the truth. And you will have a very, very hard time breaking free from it, particularly the longer you stay in it. Because it's a demon. It's, it's a spiritual influence over you. And if you let it stay, it gets, hook, it gets its hooks into you further and further. The more years you stay into it, the harder it is to get out. So, that's what C.S. Lewis loved. He loved the Orthodox Church. But he didn't join it. He remained in the Anglican. So at least we know he was good there. No, just kidding. Speaking, and then another question. Speaking as a layman, it seems to me that the theology you get out of the Chronicles of Narnia, the Great Divorce, the Screwtape Letters, is Orthodox. I was recently rereading the Screwtape Letters, and C.S. Lewis has a section where the Screwtape lead demon is writing to another little demon called Wormwood and says something like this. In misleading your Protestant convert, the best thing to do is to get him to pray extemporaneously. Make sure that the above, that above all, he does not pray the liturgical prayers his mother might have taught him. Let him think that everything he says is original. Let's talk about that a little bit. So what he's saying in the book is that the demon is, is supposedly saying to this other demon, whatever you do, don't let him pray the liturgical prayers because they're the prayers that are really powerful. Don't get him to pray extemporaneously like praying like out of your heart. I mean, wouldn't that be? You, you're, you're praying to God. You're not praying some scripted, rote prayer. Okay? You're praying to God as a born-again Christian, but they're saying, oh, that, that's what they, supposedly, that's what the demons want us to do. They want us to, well, God forbid, don't let them pray those liturgical prayers, because evidently, that's what shakes hell. Give me a break, it's the exact opposite. That's why he put it in there. He's trying, this guy is good at what he does, man. And it's not C.S. Lewis. Let's boil this back again. We battle not against flesh and blood, but against princes, principalities, and rulers of wickedness in high places. So what we're battling and what we're seeing in C.S. Lewis's writings isn't C.S. Lewis so much. It's the demons and the devils that are controlling and inspiring him to pen this to paper. That's what we're seeing, right? So I, I, I should have said that up front because we're kind of getting our, our eyes on the man when it really should be on the demons and devils that are influencing his writings. <laughs> that Oh man, isn't that subtle? That last quote? So in other words, the liturgical prayers are where it's at. I mean, but if this is a big secret that the devil doesn't want us to know. And it's exactly the exact opposite. Because remember, Satan is the father of lies. When I read C.S. Lewis, I hear an orthodox voice. I hear a sacramentalist and a liturgical traditionalist writing. How do evangelical, let alone fundamentalist Protestants, read C.S. Lewis and think that they are reading someone who is on their side? That's what this guy is asking this Catholic, okay? He says, how are they, even this guy, is saying, how do evangelical, let alone fundamentalist Protestants, read C.S. Lewis and think that they are reading someone who is on their side? I would agree. How could they? Here is the answer from the Catholic, who who's studied C.S. Lewis his whole life, or most of his life. He says, maybe I'm being a little bit naughty. <laughs> Don't you love that part? Maybe I'm being a little bit naughty. But the answer is probably the same way they read the Bible. Apparently, it's possible to read the Bible as a Protestant for 60 or 70 years and to never see it. So, let's, let's clarify this point here. The question was really, how is to someone that's a Bible-believing Christian, let's just say that, how is that person to read C.S. Lewis and think that they're reading someone who's on their side? Well, this Catholic says, 
probably the same way they read the Bible. Apparently it's possible to read the Bible as a Protestant for 60 or 70 years and never see it. And that's very, very true. Most people that are in churches for year after year after year, they're in these dead denominations, and they're not even saved. They, they might have been reading the Bible for 60, 70 years, and they don't see it either. By the same token, C.S. Lewis... C.S. Lewis's evangelical American, quote, clientele simply don't get it. This is what this Catholic is saying. Lewis's clientele. If you're a follower of Lewis, he refers to you as his clientele. Why? How did he make money? By selling his books? His writings, right? Well, isn't the love of money the root of all evil? If you have a clientele, that implies that they're, they're your client. They're coming to you for a service, and you're providing them a service, and you're making money. I think it's a very accurate statement. C.S. Lewis had a lot to gain by winning over evangelicals for the money, but he also could corrupt them through his perverted writings. So subtle. When C.S. Lewis speaks of the blessed sacrament, they don't hear it. This is what this Catholic is saying. He's right. When Lewis speaks of the prayers of the church, the liturgies, they don't hear it. When Lewis speaks of auricular confession, meaning in the ear, meaning when you say it to a priest, which is totally unbiblical, when Lewis speaks of auricular confession in his own writings, which he practiced, they don't hear it. C.S. Lewis would have been very, very ill at ease with his eager North American free church clientele. In other words, C.S. Lewis would have not been comfortable in the average church that would absolutely elevate this man on a total pedestal and almost worship him like a god. He wouldn't even be comfortable in their churches. Because, let's say they're not doing the liturgy, they're not doing the sacraments, they're not doing auricular confession, they don't believe in purgatory, they don't believe in prayers for the dead. We haven't even gotten into a couple of these things yet, but we're going to see that later. And here's a Catholic that sees it a hundred times better than the average Christian that follows C.S. Lewis. All of this stuff is in his writings. We've already quoted a whole bunch of it. Yet, most people refuse to see it, hear it, or believe it. Again, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So I'm going to stop there. We're going to go to part two next.